Welcome to Talking Giants, presented by John Boy Media. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick, And it's the first off-season pod of the off-season. Justin, who are we taking with the 25th pick in the NFL draft? <laughs> Can't even comprehend that. The amount of mock drafts that I've seen just in the last two days has given me anxiety. A lot of anxiety, Bobby Skinner. I got a DM. It's like, who are we drafting? I was like, you know what? I'm not even responding Stop. to this. I'm not even responding to this. Um, Football is such a cruel sport. You mentioned it on the, the pod just that we did two days ago. We we thought that we'd be back in a, you know, oh, yeah, we may, we may be back in like four days. Nope, we're back in like two. Um, yeah, you mentioned how football is such a cruel sport. It's like, all right, we put everything on the line. Our hearts, our souls, our our metaphorical blood, sweat, and tears, because the players actually do that, but we put it all on the line as fans. And then, lo and behold, you're eliminated from the playoffs one day later. All right, mock drafts. Here we go. Let's go. Let's get it done. <laughs> let's let's make this team better. Um, no, it's it's. I'm back in Florida. Going to be here for actually going to Alabama next week. So yeah. I'm not going to be here for a while. Yeah, I'm not recovered. I'm not recovered from this whole playoff run. And you know, you, you were traveling more. I obviously I, I live around here, but I, I'm still not even like fully recovered from these last two weeks. <laughs> oh, def- definitely not. Um, but just we got a, a Joe Shane press conference that we got to talk about. And we are doing our 2020 New York Giants Awards where we go uh, most outstanding player in offense, defense, most underrated, most underwhelming, most improved and rookie of the year. Uh, so we'll get into all that first. Justin, this episode was brought to you by who? Who were they brought to you by? Marco Verost, who Marco just had a. a a newborn, or not a wow. not a newborn. He has a he has a baby, and he's like he's like where how do I get the talking giants onesie? And I was like DM me, got him one, and then he signed up for Patreon right after. Appreciate Love you, that. Marco. Congratulations, Marco. We got Brozart, not Mozart, Brozart, Brendan, just regular old Brendan, Tyler Ebert, Logan Cox, excuse yeah. me, yeah, Stephen to- uh, Toker, he likes to toke, Joey Mack, John John. And Timothy Green, Tim Green, Green Tim. Justin, who are these people? These wonderful people went to patreon.com slash talking giants for $2 a month plus some other tiers. You get to hang out with us live while we record the shows. Bobby Skinner, he can and he will send you some stickers, magnets in the mail. Uh, and then there's some shirt raffles. You want to get on those shirts. Hopefully, I think the, the big goal this year is that we actually made shirts that will be relevant for multiple years to come. Patreon.com slash Talking Giants. Thanks to our patrons. We love you. Yes, definitely. Because a lot of times we make these awesome shirts and it's like, that guy's gone. Yep. The Joe Shane press conference, end of season press conference, which I always think is is one of the more important ones uh, for, I think like the post-draft ones are like, let's hear your reasoning on on this. Um, End of season, it's, I think is a good barometer for what's going to happen this off season. Uh, and I know you have uh, some notes, and, and we listened to the whole thing, obviously. But the main conversation that was brought up over and over and over and over again yeah. was about Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley returning. Which, funny enough, man, like he talked differently about Daniel Jones than he did Saquon Barkley. Like I come away from that press conference, Justin. Daniel Jones is one hundred percent back. One, he slipped up and saying like we're glad uh, that he's going to be here. Yeah, we're happy Daniel is going to be here. Do you take any stock in that Shane slip up? I kind of do because also it followed a Brian Dable glance over at Joe Shane, and that wasn't even that wasn't just like a st- Dable was basically a statue that entire press conference. But then he just glanced over at Joe Shane saying, "What did you just say?" <laughs> Yeah, and, and I mean, the first question was about him, and he's like, we want him to be back, and they, yeah. he explained why they want him back. So I, I come away from that, that Daniel Jones will 100% be the Giants quarterback for 2023. The question is just how much does he come in at? Um, or does DJ be like, hey, I, I, I want to go test my test myself out somewhere else, which I, I don't think is going to happen. I don't think he wants to start over with a new new team. I think he likes his coaching staff, and hopefully they're going to add some pieces around him. So I, I I would be shocked at this point if Daniel Jones is not the quarterback in 2023. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I, I think – I don't know Daniel Jones. I don't think anybody really knows Daniel Jones that well because uh, I think he does a good job of staying stoic, and no matter the crappy situation that's around him, he's going to say that it's on me. I'm the quarterback. I got to do better. But, man, how, how would you – 
not want it. If the money makes sense for the Giants, and it obviously it makes sense for Daniel Jones, but how would you not be Daniel Jones and not want to stay in this kind of situation that you have for yourself, uh, that you had for yourself this year? Because if he goes to a different situation, Bobby, it will be a team that is going to overpay him. So sure, you're going to get more money for the foreseeable future, but you're going to go to a different situation with different players, a different coach, different schematics, different everything, and it may not work out. I think the Giants, like the Giants, is the best opportunity for Daniel Jones to have long-term success as a quarterback in the National Football League. Yeah, it, it could be. I could also. See, I don't think this is going to happen, but just playing the devil's advocate, um, and I never want to advocate for the devil. He's a bad dude. Yeah. Um, the Commanders, like just like, hey, they've got a really solid wide receiver core. Um, I know they, you know, hell, they were they were interviewing Pat Shermer to be their offensive coordinator. You know, the Saints, like Chris Olave would be a great fit with Daniel Jones, and and that's a team that kind of went has went all in recently with no quarterback. You know, that could be a spot. But like I said, I'm, I'm just playing uh, the advocate. I, I think DJ 100 percent can be back for the New York Giants, and Joe yeah. Shane basically said it. So he did multiple times. <laughs> Saquon Barkley, the way he talked about Saquon was different, and this may be negotiating tactics, but when he was asked about Saquon, which is only the second question, so it wasn't like he was getting tired of hearing the question. It was the second question he got after the DJ one. He brought up stuff like, hey, we want everybody back. Like, if, if we could, we'd have everybody back. But he's like, we got to be realistic. We got to step back from the season and take emotion out of it. He brought up cap, and he said – that they weren't really close at all when they did negotiate with Saquon Barkley. Where I think, I really think, and I hope, that this is heading for the franchise tag with Saquon Barkley. Yeah, he said we were off on the value, Joe Shane said. And I think it was the Ralph Vacchiano uh, quote in the report that came out that Barkley was offered around $12 million uh, per season during the bye week. And Shane, Shane says that they weren't close on the value and Barkley did come out and say which was th- this whole thing is weird between besides Daniel Jones Daniel Jones is playing it close to the chest and he's playing it right but between Leonard Williams and especially what Saquon Barkley had to say is that I want to be a giant for life and I'm not looking to reset the the market which again weird things for players to admit but um that was very very interesting Joe Shane's comments especially saying that we're off on the value and we weren't even that close when the offer was 12 million dollars per year over the bye week apparently yeah, and I would like to hear that report from somebody else, to be honest. Um, but if that's true, like I get it. You know, hey, players head into free agency. But if Saquon Barkley turns down twelve million dollars a year, that's insane to me. That is insane when you look at his career. When you look at his career, and he brought up, hey, he brought up the injury history himself. Yeah, he did too, which again, it was just, it was just crazy. <laughs> and listen, he is not the same like playmaker he was the first two years. Of his career. He's just not. He was very good this year, but he's not the same playmaker. Um, you know, and that's the Nick Chubb contract. And I know Cap goes up every year, but like the Nick Chubb contract is generous for 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 Saquon Barkley. Because guess what? Those guys were drafted in the same draft. Nick Chubb has outperformed uh Saquon Barkley essentially every year of his career besides the rookie season. Like every every single year, like Nick Chubb has cleared Saquon Barkley in production. Um, you know, besides besides you know Nick Chubb's not uh, getting involved in the receiving game too much, but even that, like Saquon's not a great receiving back, right? He's not a great route runner. He is a great matchup, so you can get him involved in the receiving game and he can make plays. And we saw that towards the end of the season. But like, if he's all if he's turning down twelve mil then this is heading for the franchise tag because I don't think it should even be 10 mil to be honest with his injury. Like it's, it's, we should do an episode where we talk about these in depth. You know, I don't want to do this on the post uh, season press conference pod, but I, I like this could, this is to me, this is heading for the, towards the franchise tag. If he turned down 12 mil and Shane said, we're not even close, which they, if he's, if he like, I don't know. Like, I don't like the fact that Joe, if that's true, Joe Shane offered 12 mil. Unless it's one, unless it's basically a one-year deal with two like empty contract, empty years on it. Let me ask you a question here, because it's not paying Saquon Barkley for the twenty twenty. What year are we in? For the twenty twenty three twenty twenty four season, that's that's not what bothers me. It's paying Saquon Barkley for the years after that, and then what is the price tag that's associated with it? So let me ask you a question. You know that big breakaway run that he had against the Eagles this past weekend, where he got caught. 
Does he get caught in 2018 and 2019? I don't think so. Now, he maxed out at like 19 miles per hour on that run. Earlier in the season, he maxed out at like 21 versus the Titans. Yeah. Um, But he's there is no denying that he is not the same athlete that he was those first two seasons. He was good There's, this year, I mean, but he, he was not like, the same athlete. His longest touchdown was what? Uh, like 29, 40 yards? I, I went and broke him down a couple of weeks ago. Like Max was 40 yards. Uh like he, yeah, like he, th- this was a guy who created those things, those plays consistently, uh, you know, and he is a good back and I want him back on the Giants next year. But to me, with a franchise tag projected to be $10.1 million with Saquon Barkley, it's, it's not the nicest thing in the world to do, but it's a cutthroat business. I would franchise tag him, especially if he's turning down 12 mil, you kind of have to franchise tag him. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And again, it's, this is nothing against Saquon Barkley as a person. This is nothing against Saquon Barkley as a player, especially right now. It's just the nature of the beast when it comes to the running back position and just how dependent that position is on so much going right. That includes the offensive line. I mean, you include you know the, the Chubb deal. Well, Nick Chubb has had one of the best offensive lines in the National Football League for the last few years. So, of course, Nick Chubb has been more productive than Saquon Barkley, and he's been healthier. So there's so much that goes into it, especially with health, especially with health that is out of Saquon Barkley's control. So you know where I'm at. Um, and I, I, I come away from this press conference very much trusting that Joe Shane is going to do the right thing for the New York Football Giants. Yeah. So, and, and the Vakiano report said he was wanting 16 mil, which w- would is McCaffrey money. So if he got the same money as McCaffrey, he's not resetting the market, you know. So it could have been a good play of words on with Saquon, um, but yeah, I I, th- I think this is going towards the tag. Like it's, it's the only thing that it's really to me it's the only thing that makes sense to do. Yeah. And honestly, if he if you're offering twelve mil, well, you tag him on ten mil, and the next year, what's the tag for the running back going to be? Eleven and a half mil? You tag like I know it becomes guaranteed. I just thought it was very noticeable that Joe Shane was. A lot more like bringing up outside circumstances with oh, Saquon yeah. Barkley, with Daniel Jones. Like we want him to be back. He's, you know, we, you know, we're gonna do. Like we gotta talk about it, but we're gonna do what we can to get him back. Yeah, I, I think they want to bring both of them back, but there were a lot more parameters surrounding Saquon Barkley being back compared to Daniel Jones. It seemed pretty black and white with Daniel Jones. He, we want him to be back. He's probably going to be back, and it just comes down to the business side of it. With Saquon Barkley, it came down to the value. It comes down to this. It comes down to the business side of things. So there were a lot more parameters surrounding Saquon Barkley than than Daniel Jones. And um, I have, obviously, more thoughts on you know, paying a running back, but I kind of want to save that for whenever we do have a devoted episode to it. Yeah. Um, what what other notes did you have from the press conference? Because it was it was a lot of little things, but mostly it was just DJ Saquon stuff. Yeah, I, I do have a decent amount of little things. Uh, I would have loved. This is the one question that I really loved for the for, from the beat. I would have loved to hear more. Like, what did you think about the way that the Giants performed in this area? Or what did you think about like to say, take for example, there wasn't a question about Andrew Thomas. You know, uh, Andrew Thomas is a guy that was drafted outside of this of this regime. So I would have liked to hear a little bit more just on field stuff, especially, you know, I, I think the priority this offseason of the Giants is how can they become a more explosive offense? Again, which I thought it was going to be a priority this past offseason, but I think it's priority number one of this offseason now that they've had an offseason already in the building. None of that was really asked, which is a shame, but hopefully it gets asked eventually. We also but, have no clue when we're getting a, a director of call scouting either. Yeah, and yeah, that that was not asked. However, I, I kind of think that role, I think that role is a little overblown because I think who who's that guy that we who's the former GM of Miami, who's uh, uh, in the is front it office, Rosetti? Chris Rosetti. I think probably I th- probably getting that wrong, but th- there's somebody who was who Joe Shane was connected with in Miami, who was the former GM of the Dolphins, who I think is just presuming that role of director of college scouting. So, um, but that would have been a good question to ask, and if that's actually going to happen, I don't think it's going to happen. Zeddy is pro scouting. Um, yeah, what's this guy's anyways, name? What do you so what what do, what do you got for the rest of the press? The little things, yes. Joe Shane, I just want to point out just the the flow of the press conference too. Joe Shane and Brian Dable sitting right next to each other, and Joe Shane basically doing ninety percent of the talking. 
yeah, I, could it could it mean something? Yeah, but here's what I think it means. And I actually just I, I got off the phone today with the uh, the same person that has given me kind of tips and scoops on Kadarius Tony's timeline and you know how much the Giants like Evan Neal, Kayvon Thibodeau, and so you know this person and also the same person that told me that Joe Shane was going to be the GM of the Gi- of the Giants and I Dennis the- Hickey. Dennis Hickey, thank you. That's not my source, but uh, I was on the phone with him. Uh, the, uh, today and you know just talk about how close Joe Shane and Brian Dable are like it's not it's not just a good professional in the building relationship it's a very good outside of the building relationship too like they're legit close and they're legit friends so um seeing them sit next to each other and Joe Shane taking up 90% of the time in the in the postseason presser I think that's pretty cool it means that they're kind of in sync it means that they're kind of balanced uh Joe Shane he continued to preach patience and dedication to the process Dable mentioned the word process quite a few times uh, as well. Uh, Joe Shane doesn't believe in the notion that you're ever just one player away. It's a team game, doubling down on not making any moves at the trade deadline. Because um, I know there was a question about, do you feel like you're a wide receiver away? And then Joe Shane's, no, it's a team game. That's why we kind of stood pat at the trade deadline. This is a, this is pretty key. Emphasizing the advantage of extending guys in-house because you already know how they work, how they perform, how they trained, and the kind of people they are. Um, extending the people, your guys in-house, takes the guesswork out of things like free agency. And what the Giants do in free agency may be impacted by the guys that they want to extend in-house as well. As Bobby Skinner, unfortunately, is a sneezing fit off camera. But Bobby, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm back home, baby. Uh <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think that's a good thing. It's just kind of getting people ready for it. Hey, don't expect some huge free agency spree, right? And we don't and I don't want that, right? Like I want I want to bring our guys back. I don't want to bring everybody back on on whatever their you know max contract would be. But like I do not want to go into this free agency on some huge spending spree. If there's a proven linebacker out there you want to go get, and yeah, then then you could do that. But uh I think we've seen like and there's certain positions, is like certain positions where good players get to free agency um and there are certain positions where they don't like wide receiver like yeah like great wide receivers aren't going to make it to free agency anymore they're either going to get traded um or re-signed with their team um and we saw i mean we we basically saw that with with kenny galladay yeah um you know he also got asked about odell which i thought was yeah i i don't have people that com- as, people I don't have complained that as about that i don't think people can complain about that one they invited that by meeting with them too they did if you guys don't you can't shut up about them of course they're gonna ask anyways yeah and when it comes to emphasizing the draft over free agency as a way that you build the roster i mean joe shane had this to say about free agency you when you when you shop hungry you overpay it's a bad deal and then you get buyer's remorse it's important in free agency to come up with the proper value so um i'm willing to Sit patient and wait because we thought that from Joe Judge and Dave Gettleman's first offseason together that they were going to be smart and spend responsibly, and then they didn't go out and do that, and they spent very irresponsibly. So, yeah, their second free agency. Their second free agency. No, I their said, first well, free agency was great. That's what I said. They're, during their first free agency, they oh, okay. spent responsibly, and then we thought that they were going to do the same thing, and then the second free agency, they did not spend responsibly. So um, we'll we'll see what Joe Shane and company does this year, but we have that quote. Uh, at least we presume that he's going to spend responsibly again. And I think Joe Shane really does care about uh, being in good cap health. He talked about being in good cap health multiple times. Uh, Shane recognizing the talent gap. This was significant. Uh, recognizing the talent gap between the top remaining NFC teams, particularly the Eagles, and pointing out uh, if that that the Giants went one five and one in the division this year, including the playoffs. Winning the East is a priority for them. Cool. Love to hear. It. Yeah, I mean that's as much as we want to fall in love with the season, we should. There is a clear talent gap between us and even the Cowboys. Even though I think the Cowboys are going to be on the downswing for talent because their cap situation is like so effed right now. Yeah, and they're paying they, Ezekiel Elliott sixteen million dollars. And, unless they continue to just keep on moving Dak's money into the future every single year, like they have some serious issues with some with some good free agents that they're going to have to let go. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the Dallas Cowboys are pretty damn good at the draft too, so they'll. <laughs> They'll replenish. And speaking of, speaking of the cap, Shane mentioned how limited they were to add resources during the season and moves that could have helped earlier 
Um, and I'm and I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of the interior defensive line and maybe even getting interior linebacker a little bit earlier in the season. Uh, I was very happy to hear that he gave props to the per, to his personnel staff, to his pro personnel staff, that they did add guys like Isaiah Hodgins, uh, Jason Pinnock, Nick McLeod, a lot of key contributors uh, during the season. But he did say that because of how cap stricken they were, there were certain moves that they could have made earlier in the season to help out the team and they could not do it. So um, I'm happy to see that next year when we are in a little bit more of a healthier cap spot, that if there are moves they want to make in season, like they felt they could have, there, there could have been more on the table in terms of roster additions they could have made in season this year. Yeah. And I think that's something to keep in mind. And I, we talked about a pre-show where it's like, Hey, you know, you can backload a contract into the second year, but guess what? We want to resign guys like Andrew Thomas, Dexter. We like, we want to extend guys, you know, even, you know, a guy like McKinney. So, like I think they're setting themselves up to be healthy cap space like year in year out, whereas with the Giants it's like okay we got a lot of cap space this year but next year we're gonna be screwed you know which is the situation the Giants were in in this season so um I I I think I don't think they earned everything they got this year and he was asked if they over exceeded and he said no and I agree they did not over exceed they took the talent they had and they have their coaching staff their coaching staff is still gonna be here. They they over exceeded expectations, but I, I it's not a fluke, right? Doesn't mean they're guaranteed a playoff spot next year. Um, where was I going with this point? I lost it. Where was the start? It's all right. It? It's all right. No, but you, you know you were just talking about the Giants over exceeded expectations, but it wasn't a fluke. And oh yeah, like they're not going to go all in. Like okay, we made a playoffs this year. Like they they know like Gettleman would do that. Gettleman would go like, oh, because we won nine games this year, maybe we over exceeded expectations. Let's do something crazy and wild to double down on it that we're going to be better next year. Yeah, but yeah, basically saying because they didn't get just because they were one of the last eight teams doesn't mean they're a few moves away from being one of the two or four last teams. Right. Like they still do have a ways to go to get into that final four. Process. It's about process. Um, and the way that you um, really emphasize that process is by drafting well and Joe Shane uh, even gave a summary of of the draft class this year by going into I think every single player he like touched on in this in this little speech they had uh basically the overall theme was that everyone mostly everyone was hurt at, at one point or another and a lot of these guys suffered season ending injuries uh you know he mentioned that Evan Neal struggled through some injuries at some point Kayvon was Kayvon Juan Dale had a 100 yard receiving game in the same game that he tore his ACL he did mention Cordell Flott um, you know, Cordell Flott's like one of those big, you know, hey, what? how much faith are they going to put in Cordell Flott? Do they see him as a CB2 next year? Um, so what are they going to do in free agency in the draft this year to add to that room? Um, you know, he went into basically all these guys, including Darian Beavers, who he said specifically was competing for Mike Linebacker number one before he went down with his torn ACL. How much are they going to put into the Mike Linebacker room this offseason? Do they think Darian Beavers can step in there? So uh, we'll, we'll see all about that. But basically, the summary of this draft class is that mostly everyone was hurt and a lot of these guys had season ending injuries. Yeah, it's kind of crazy how injured this rookie class is. All right, do you got anything else on this? Uh, Joe Shane thanked the media for getting Leonard Williams to admit that he's taking a pay cut, the, which was the, funny. The Leonard Williams and Saquon Barkley quotes on Monday were like, what is going on right now? Like, yeah. How, why are they doing this? Like, What is Joe Shane doing to these agents? Yeah, uh, yeah, like their agents have to be like, "Come, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Even though it doesn't make too much of a difference at the end of the day. Um, regardless. All right, let's, I want to get into awards. Whoa, but first, we got to talk. But first, oh. no, no, but first, Justin, we got to take care of something very uh, important. Vernon Butler, Ja'Shawn Corbin, Corey oh. Cunningham, Zion Gelbert, Devery uh, Ham- Hamilton, Jaden Mickens, Dre Miller, Khalil Pimpton, Makai Polk, Trenton Thompson, and Chris Myrick signed futures contracts. Quick, which one is your favorite one on there for the future? Like, Which I'm one's just- like one guy who can make play on the roster and we, we can was, leave out Chris Myrick because he can't be stopped we all know that I was thinking about Roman and the ad that I was about to read that I missed half the names that you read just Sean Corbin's one of them right yeah running back is always the easy one yeah that's where I'm going are we still are we still invested in Andre Miller H back oh actually yes very much so yeah Trenton Thompson and the safety I'm gonna I'm going to say... Trent Thompson could be a good special teamer. You know, I'm going to stick with some FAU pride. I'm going to go Zion Gilbert. He did start yeah. a game at nickel for the Giants this year. So I'm, I'm going to go arms. Zion Gilbert. 
yeah, lo- very it's a long corner. Uh, all right, Justin, I am happy. I I am happy that Andre Miller's here though, at least for camp, right? Yeah. I think that's what future you're you're here for camp. Yeah, it's basically like a you can be cut at any time type contract. Perfect. Not perfect. Don't get cut. All right, we got to talk about Roman. I want you to be Roman ready for this Valentine's Day. I don't have any special plans. Bobby Skinner says it's one of those holidays that he avoids because he likes to be different. Are you Roman ready for sex? Roman 2023 really just not not going with any innuendos, not going with any jokes, just leaning into if you want to be Roman ready, you got to be ready for sex. Leaning right into it, which I really love. A strong sex life can deepen your feelings of intimacy with your partner, and it can increase your overall happiness. And Roman addresses a variety of sexual health needs for men. And it's also just if you want to be healthy, Roman has a bunch of stuff for men's health in General, they offer genuine medication that helps achieve and maintain a strong erection. Roman also offers discreet wipes that helps you last four times longer in bed. And treating lower testosterone can help revive your sex drive. Roman has testosterone testing and treatment. And to get ready, Roman ready for better sex this Valentine's Day, go to ro.co slash John Boy today to get 20% off your entire first order. Do it by February 8th for guaranteed shipping in time. That's ro.co slash John Boy. You'll be glad you did. You'll be glad you did. All right, it's time for awards, baby. At least this year we won't have comments like, nobody on this team deserves an award. Mm. Lots of people. uh, There was one particular category where I was a little upset with the voters. But we're going to start, Justin, with the most important to me, and that's the offensive, offensive most outstanding player. In 2020, uh, mine was uh, Nick Gates. Yours, uh, yours was Sterling Shepard. Last year, we were both at Andrew Thomas. Now, the listeners, back to back, going back to back. Andrew Thomas, the listeners voted Andrew Thomas as the offensive most outstanding player with 182 votes. Saquon was second with 51 votes. Daniel Jones was 28. Uh, wh- who is going to be your offensive most outstanding player, Justin? My most outstanding offensive player will be Andrew Thomas. It has to be, right? Like he is like and we do most outstanding player to stop it from like being, you know, I hate the most valuable argument. Um he's their best player on offense. Um I think he's their best player on the roster. He continues to get better every year. Uh, you know, and this guy's won he won rookie of the year for for the listeners his rookie year. Won it uh most outstanding last year. Last year was a, just a clean sweep. He is an elite left tackle, all pro player. He's all pro and elite. I, th- I think he has to go to it. Even, you know, Saquon Barkley, a little bit of streaky. Daniel Jones, as good as he was, he doesn't have like top of the league in his in his position type numbers or performance. So to me, I think it's easy, Andrew Thomas, all the way around. Here's where I want to ask you. Are you like me and would you have Daniel Jones second to Andrew Thomas? Yes. Yes, because when the last quarter of the season is when I felt that this team was at its best in terms of sustainable football, not just sustainable winning football for this year, but sustainable winning football for years to come. And that's when Daniel Jones was throwing on early downs, being efficient, not earlier in the season when we were just running, running, running the ball. And Saquon definitely carried it in in the week one. Week two was a defensive carry while Daniel Jones struggled in those games. Even in that middle of the season where they were running the ball, playing play action, DJ was playing awesome. Like he was playing to, you know, perfection. You know, he wasn't making mistakes. Uh, I do think Daniel Jones took second. But something I asked for last year is where this award wouldn't be so boring. I like that you have Andrew Thomas is the clear one, but that's just because he's so great. And then I think you have like two guys where. In other years, they would have won this award with the with Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. So uh, let's let's guess let's get a wide receiver in the mix. Uh, with, yeah, the with only this group the only issue year. the only issue is that there's such a wide gap between the first three and then number four. Yeah, nobody even got a fourth place vote, which is very rare for these type of awards. Like there's always like some stragglers. Not a single person got a fourth place vote or a, a first a vote outside the top three. So Andrew Thomas, congratulations, you are. Back-to-back Offensive Most Outstanding Player uh, Award. 
Defensive most outstanding player. This was the biggest, most lopsided in our award history. Dexter Lawrence got 248 votes. Adore Jackson, Julian Love, and Larry Williams each got one. I can see the one for Adore Jackson. I don't see how anyone voted Julian Love or, or Leonard Williams. I want to save some of my talking points on Dexter Lawrence for another award, and I don't like doubling up on awards, but he is also my defensive player of the year, most outstanding player of the year. He is also my most outstanding player of the year. There, there's sometimes where I like to get cute, and I like to just – I like to challenge myself to think of, oh, how can you challenge yourself to think of a reasoning for an award? There is no reason to do that. Dexter Lawrence, defensive, most outstanding player of the year. I mean, week in, week out, he was the best player on the defense. You know, Adore played really well, but he missed a big chunk of the season. Uh, McKinney, you know, he wouldn't have won it even if he did play the whole season. Uh, there's no other corners. The linebackers are horrible. Leonard Williams was in and out. Kayvon and Aziz, those guys aren't going to win it. Like, uh, I, I hate. I, it's kind of boring talking about it like this, but he was. There's a reason why he got 200. Uh, what was it? 248 votes, and the rest got th- a total of three. Um, like he is the clear. So, um, I my talking points are going to come more so in his most improved that's this is where i think the awards show so congratulations dexter Lawrence. So who, who did so last year mine was adora jackson yours was xavier mckinney the listeners was xavier mckinney um and then 2020 mine the listeners was james bradbury yours was blake martinez all right miss most underrated justin i know this award show is getting kind of bo- was pretty boring with the first two awards most underrated i'm gonna be honest the listeners annoyed me on this one First of all, 25 players got votes for most underrated. 25. That's half the roster. You have three, you know, half the roster got most underrated votes on on the team. That doesn't make any sense. And I don't think they voted correctly. Julian Love, by the listeners, wins most underrated with 36 votes. And maybe that's like a like from way the league wide. But I view this more as like from I view this from like how do Giants fans view this player, um, and I don't think Julian Love's uh, underrated at all by Giants fans. Justin. I think he's properly rated as you no know, Giant. I think Giants fans, all Giants fans, recognize that Julian Love is a fine player. Yeah, most underrated is more fun of an award when the team sucks because it's like you know someone who doesn't get there too. Right. But like I. D- I do not think Julian Love is underrated. Second place was a tie between Graham Gano, which is like, Graham Gano is not underrated. He just plays kicker, so we don't talk about him. And Isaiah Hodgins. Isaiah Hodgins is not underrated by Giants fans, <laughs> you know? And he's starting to get recognition around the league. Adore was fourth, so that's actually like, that could have been a, a decent win. Daniel Bellinger was uh, fifth. I mean, my guy finished, I'm going to see. Let's see. So we have five. I mean, my guy finished... Like eight ninth in voting. Who is your most underrated? My most underrated is a Dory Jackson. That's a good. That's a good one. It's him missing so many games, but it's the most underrated. So it kind of that can go into it. It's like you see how valuable he is. Um, so talk about a Dory Jackson. He he missed games. Not it was not his fault. It was it was Brian Dable's fault. So that that's that's number one. Number two, you have to take the stats into a grain of salt because, you know, he did play more games in 2018, he played more games in 2019, and he did more and he did play in more games in 2021. But he was the Giants CB1 this year in a system that can be pretty tough on corners. If you're not good in man coverage, if you're not good in press man, uh, if you're not going to do with Wink, what Wink Martindale asked you to do, you could have a rough time, especially going up against some really talented wide receiver ones, especially in the NFC East. But Adoree Jackson this year, the lowest completion percentage allowed in his entire career at 51.7%, allowed 31 completions on 60 targets. Um, quarterback rating was the second lowest of his entire of his entire career. Um, last year, he had a 69 QB rating. Nice. This year, he allowed a QB rating of 83 Point nine. I don't think he had any interceptions this year, which is probably why no, zero. that was so low. He had zero interceptions, so he had one interception last year, which ultimately you know influctuates the that QB rating set. So Dory Jackson was pretty solid this year, um, and when he was on the field, there were not a lot of times where we were. You know, usually, it's like cornerback and offensive line. 
You know, when you're saying a quarterback's name, most of the time it's because maybe they're getting a penalty or they're allowing a catch. If you're saying an offensive lineman's name, it's because they're screwing up. We did not say Adoree Jackson's name all that much this year, except when we were saying, oh man, Adoree Jackson's hurt. Do not let him return punts. And oh yeah, we would have won this game if Adoree Jackson was on the field. Those were the times we said Adoree Jackson's name this year. Yeah, I, th- I think he had a case to win most underrated last season too. Uh, and he might have for, let's see, who, who did the listeners vote? last year most underrated they they did vote adore so he won most underrated for the listeners last year you voted james bradbury which i thought was a great one mine was austin johnson um yeah adore is like a shutdown corner at this point now like and and injuries are an issue you know he's missed games every single year of his career i know this year is off a punt return but that is an issue with him um but yes he is very underrated and he doesn't get talked about around the league because he doesn't get interceptions you know like even even last year, like last year, his season was an elite cornerback position, like elite cornerback play, and he just didn't get the flowers around the league that I, I think right. he deserved. And he was covering wide receiver twos, so we were expecting maybe a little bit of a drop off in play. Now that he was CB one covering wide receiver ones, they we did not get that drop off in play. He stayed the same. His elite, you know, his pretty solid, good Giants performances as being a corner stayed the same despite covering those wide receiver ones. My most underrated player of the year, and I'm passionate about this one, Darius Slayton. Because he had some drops, he got a lot of hate, and, and he does deserve the, the backlash for those drops, absolutely. This Giants team cannot operate on offense without Darius Slayton this season. They just, they couldn't. Like and, and this guy went from not playing to, for the third time in his career, in four years, leading the Giants in receiving. Third time. They don't beat the Green Bay Packers without uh, Darius Slayton. They don't beat a lot of teams without the element of speed that he brings. And guess what? You can talk about the drops. He had his highest catch rate of his career by seven points, you know, at 64%, while also having his highest yards per catch. Like his speed was such a a valuable weapon for the Giants. Where you could there's games where you were talking about how great Hodgins was. Well, guess what? Slayton had like six yards less than him, and those were like the best Hodgins games. Um, you know, like Richie James, awesome. Darius Slayton is was so important to this offense. And if they don't go out and get a wide receiver one, they have to bring back Slayton, right? Like if if they want to get go, like go get a, a true blue wide receiver one, then Darius Slayton is expendable. Uh if not, you still need Darius Slayton on this roster. And this guy went from being buried on the depth chart in camp. They were actively trying to shop him. To me, Darius Slayton is the most underrated. And he, he gets underrated because of a drop issue, which is very real and deserved with. But he was he was very needed on this roster. And this Giants season does not go as successful without Darius Slayton. There's, they, there's a good chance they don't make the playoffs without Darius Slayton on this roster. Yeah, that's exactly the question that I was going to ask you and I was going to ask Giants fans to really think about. Think of where this offense is that is not explosive. It was a very, very bad explosive pass play offense. Think of where this offense is without Darius Slayton. I know he has the drops. I know he has his flaws, but the the, the yards after the catch element, I, hey, I'll tell you what. That Texans game is a 16-16 game without an awesome Darius Slayton 70-plus yard touchdown that include like 60, 50 yards of yak. Um, you know, Darius Slayton is what was, is uh, an explosive play option for this Giants team that they desperately needed this year, and I 100% agree that he's very underrated. Yeah, so uh, Slayton may be gone from this Giants team, and I think there's a good chance he's gone from this Giants team, but his career as a New York Giant was a success for very successful fifth round. I think he's a more successful third day pick than Julian Love for Dave Gettleman. I think he is the most successful day three pick from Dave Gettleman. Um, lots of people got votes. Jason Pinnock got one vote. Dane Belton, Timon Fox. Timon Fox actually was a little underrated. Yeah. Andrew Thomas got two. Um, let's see. Underrated. <laughs> yeah. Richie James. Richie James got more than Dar- Jahad Ward got eleven. So Jahad Ward's actually pretty overrated. Um, Jawad, Jahad Ward's fun. Yeah, Kayvon got one. Dexter Lawrence got one. Mm. Matt Breida got eight. I guess you can say that, but most underrated, I I can't buy. It. Leonard Williams got three, which is actually I think Leonard Williams kind of could have been a little higher on the list, even yeah. though he didn't have a great season. All right. Um, I thought Leo had his best season against the run, at least with the Giants. Yeah, yeah, he did. 
Yeah, Leo is very important. And someone someone's note on someone left notes on theirs and it's like teams literally doubled up their yards per carry when Leonard Williams was off the field. So oh, yeah, he was for sure. he was very important. All right, most improved. I, I I'm not agreeing with the listeners, but I really like the listeners' pick. Uh they went Daniel Jones, who got 152 votes. Dex got 29. Thomas, 18. Um, Daniel Jones is very deserving of this award. I know we've talked about how he hasn't made huge strides because it's just an offensive coaching staff that is competent and good. You know, more than competent, they're good. Um, but he did improve one. Even though the turnover issue was gone a couple years ago, he did, like, turn over the ball the best in the league. Like he was the best in the league at protecting the football. Yeah. Um, and as an improviser using his legs, it was his best year. Uh, you know, I know they didn't attack deep, but definitely very deserving of this award, Justin, but I'm, I'm voting Dexter Lawrence and I hate doubling up on awards. And I, I almost did Ben Bredesen, but Dex improved so, so much like astronomical improvement. We came into this year saying, what about Dexter Lawrence? Like, we need you to be more than a good player. We need you to be a great player. And that's what he was, obviously, you know, one defensive player of the year. He had five more sacks than he did uh, his uh, the previous season. 17 more QB hits than his career high. 17 more. Well, and guess what? That wasn't an outlier with QB hits. He had 19 more pressures. You know, he had, uh, you know, was the second in pass rush win rate tied with Aaron Donald. You know, the second uh, in total sack pressures and, and hits to Chris Jones. Like, he won, he made all pro this year in a year where defensive tackle play was great, which was amazing. Quentin Williams, Chris Jones, there's so many good, like, you know, uh, um, you know, Jeff Simmons, like there's so much great defensive tackle play around the league. And this man from a nose tackle spot was getting recognition league wide. Like I think his improvements were so astronomical that I couldn't not vote for him, even though I kind of wanted to change it up and vote Ben Bredesen. Who's fifth in the league in QB hits. He had one more than Micah Parsons. That's insane stuff. Insane. Every week. It was besides the Eagles game. Actually, even in the not the not the playoff game, but even the Eagles game, he got lined up on guards. I think he had a, a sack on Landon Dickerson. Um, you know, and he had QB hits in that game. Like every single week he produced. Every single week. And remember remember the first two weeks of the season? How like on our player profile projection, Justin, I was like, I was like, I c I don't want to be talking about how good you are on film. It's like we need you right. to be great, right? And we were so frustrated after the first two games of the year. It's like, he's playing amazing, but you don't see the good stats yet. And then the stats follow, you know, which if you play great, the stats will follow that, um, except for in some outlier year. So Dexter Lawrence was my most improved. And he did it from the nose tackle spot too, which I think is super, super tough to do, right? I, I, I think I think performing that way, like, like Leonard Williams in 2020. Leonard Williams in 2020 had better stats like he cracked over 30 QB hits he had more sacks he might have even had more tackles for loss but the dominance down in down out that Dexter Lawrence had was just top of the league like ultra insane insane stuff um and it's coming from that nose tackle spot that I think is a little bit tougher compared to if you're rushing three tech five tech etc cetera, etc cetera. so um Dexter Lawrence most improved and I think Dexter Lawrence is deserving to have doubled up on awards defensive most outstanding and then also most improved as well because it just goes to show it's an affirmation of how much he really did improve from his previous years let's talk about daniel jones though because this time last year we were like you know they declined his option we're like there's a very little chance this guy is the quarterback again we said he's got to win games and produce and we'll do a daniel jones year in review at some point podcast but Honestly, like now that this dust has settled a little bit, like hats off, dude. Like you've had a tough career, man, with some bad circumstances and the circumstances this year weren't even great. And you made the absolute most out of them, the absolute most, Um, you know, and now like two days after the season and the the brand new GM who declined your option is saying like, yeah, he's going to be our quarterback. Like, (laughs) yeah. You know, and a guy, and, and it's not like this guy who you know is loved around the league, and everyone's giving him a shot. Like he kind of gets bashed around the league. Um, so, congrats to Daniel Jones. And this is the first time Daniel Jones has won an award because we didn't do it in 2019, where he would have won. Definitely would have won Rookie of the Year. Would he have won Most Outstanding Offensive? I think Saquon probably. Yeah, 2019. Yeah, people would have people 
would have given the Saquon. People were so excited about DJ. None of the wide receivers would have done it. Yeah. 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 All right. Most, most, most underwhelming. This is the tightest. Like when I was doing, usually by like 25% through counting the votes, Justin, I'm like, okay, this is, this is a guy who's going to win. This one kept on going back and forth. I'm like, oh, this guy has it. And they're like, nope, this guy just got four votes in a row. Most underwhelming. Mark Lewinsky finished third with 11. First place got 84 votes. Second place got 83 votes. Literally one vote made the difference. But your 2022 most underwhelming player of the year is Evan Neal. Justin, are, are, is, is that who is your most underwhelming player of the year? Yeah, my most underwhelming player of the year is also Evan Neal. I'm going to go Kenny Gall all day. And Evan Neal was definitely underwhelming. And I know people are like, well, he's a rookie. Look at Andrew Thomas. Andrew Thomas won rookie of the year, right? Like I, I talked about it in it and I was, we were proud of Andrew Thomas's rookie season at, by the end of the year. It started off bad, obviously, but he, we were proud of his rookie season. We, we saw linear growth. That's what you wanted to see out of him. Neil, there has been really no growth in his game this year. Zero. And it was, and it was worse than what we saw from Andrew Thomas. So he's definitely deserved. I voted Kenny Galladay, and Kenny Galladay won this last year by the listeners, and I disagree. I disagree with him. I had like five people ahead of him. It's not the fact that Kenny Galladay wasn't good, and Kenny Galladay was a solid wide receiver for the Giants in 2021. And if we had that same Kenny Galladay, he would have been the wide receiver one on the Giants this year. They got nothing out of him. Nothing. It was one thing to go in this year thinking like Galladay is not going to be very good for the Giants. But they got nothing. Like they, they, they didn't even play him, and rightfully so. Like rightfully so, he couldn't get off the line of scrimmage. Um, that's why. And and I, I think I, I had. No, I, I don't think I did have higher expectations for Kenny Galladay than the 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 general public. So that's and that's going into my my personal vote. Um, but that's why I went Kenny Galladay because at least Evan Neal's a rookie. With Galladay, it's like man, you gave us absolutely nothing this season. Like zero, zilch, nada. Yeah, I I gave it to Neil because I expect more out of him in the future. And even heading into this year, I was more sure that this was Kenny Galladay's last year instead of him having more years on the Giants. So I was much more invested into Evan Neal's just his 2022 season than I was Kenny Galladay. Now I won't I won't deny that I I did I think that the Giants were going to get. Something out of Kenny Galladay this year? Yes. <laughs> I did not think that the only good moment that he was going to have was a garbage time touchdown against Darius Slay, and that would be his only touchdown in a Giants uniform ever. I did not think that was going to be the case. Yeah, it. I, I can't believe how bad it was this year. Like, I, there was no no thought of me ever was I like this Galladay would be this bad. Not even close. Like, if you told me, like, worst case scenario for Galladay... It's like twenty catches, two hundred fifty yards, Seriously. and he gets hurt. Like and he led, like, the, all right. like he led the Giants in receiving last season. You know, um, you know, and Shep played a, a decent chunk of games. Slayton was around for the most of the year, um, and he led them in receiving. And I, and I thought with Daniel Jones, he was a good receiver who was being used the wrong way. And this year, man, it's I don't know if there's hip surgery or what. So that's that's why I voted Galladay, but Neil was a very close second. And again, the most the tightest voting we've ever had. In awards last year for most underwhelming, I voted Saquon. You've actually voted Galladay with the listeners. Mine in 2020 was Slayton, and then yours and the listeners was Evan Ingram. But looking back, yeah. I actually view Evan Ingram. All right, rookie of the year. First time for me, it's not a Georgia dog. Mm. The listeners went cave on this was this was a runaway train, uh, and I'll, I'm also going cave on. I mean, it's it's. You don't even really have any other options, right, Justin? No, there is no other options. Cave on Thibodeau. I mean, it's if you wanted to get cute, you could say Juan Dale, but he had what two hundred yards. Evan Neal, obviously not. No, Cordell you would have Flott. to give it off of. No. You would have to give it like to Juan Dale based off of like three quarters. <laughs> yeah. 
So it, it's just an easy one. And it's not like Kayvon had some amazing year. But Kayvon, you look at his year and like, okay, that guy's going to be a good pass rusher. Can he get to the great level? Like you look at him against the other rookie pass rushers the last two years. It's like, oh, he's he's right there in that top quadrant uh, of guys. Um, and, you know, he didn't get the sack totals that you would have wanted. But he did he did impact games. You know, that Commander's game obviously was huge for him. So Kayvon Thibodeau. To, was a was an easy vote for rookie of the year, but Daniel Bellinger could have sneaked in there. Yeah, it's a shame. Bellinger that, was very important for the Giants. Oh, he was very very important. It's just a shame that Daniel Bellinger had some underrated, big oh no, mistakes this year. Uh, that fumble against Minnesota. There was a drop that he had against Washington. I think it was the Sunday night game, but that I don't think it mattered. Did he have a drop against the home Washington game? I don't know. Um, it was the road game. It was the one we won. It was the one we won. All right, so it doesn't matter. The mistakes don't matter in wins. But uh, yeah, Daniel Bellinger's impact is, is was very important. I just want to see him take on more of a responsibility in the actual pass game and not just blocking and being an underneath target. Yeah, but he was very important. And I yeah, like, like totally. when I see Evan Ingram, like people talk about how Evan Ingram's having a great year. I do not miss him at all. I don't because Bellinger. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't count the votes total on this because coding, voting was taking a lot. So if I screw this up, I will issue a correction. Um, that's In fact, I, as soon as we get done with the podcast, Justin, I will count them and be like, if count I was them. wrong. But I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident it was Kayvon when I was looking through it. Just, it takes like 20 minutes to count for each single There is no category. other answer. Uh, how many QB hits did, uh, did Kayvon Thibodeau have this year, Bobby? Nine. Nine, he had 13. How many QB hits did Aziz Ojolari have last year? 11. 13, so they had the same amount of QB hits, and Kayvon Thibodeau played in a total of 740 snaps. I have a feeling this is going to be somewhat similar. Yeah. Uh, Aziz Ojolari played in 780 snaps last year, so uh, Aziz Ojolari, I think overall, just had a better rookie year, had more sacks, had more moments but Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, in some of those stats they like to look at, that kind of predicts sustainable pass rushing success. Aziz Ojolari, 13 QB hits. Kayvon Thibodeau this year, 13 QB hits. And I actually, like, when I watch both those guys' rookie years, I view Kayvon as a better player, right? Um, because Aziz would be... Aziz would win a couple plays a game. Kayvon's had games where he just, like, would win consistently, where Aziz never had that as a rookie. Um, now, Kayvon has had some cold streaks, too. Um, but I, I, I view Kayvon as a more disruptive pass rusher than Aziz Ojolari and, and a better run defender too. Um, so like, I, I, I know if you're just looking at raw stats, Aziz is, has a bet, better rookie season than Kayvon, but I just film wise, I would, I would put my finger on Kayvon for that. Um, so no, so no Georgia dog won it. Um, so Tough. last year Aziz won it except for you. Decided to be cute and pick Aaron Robinson. I did, yeah. Um, and then Andrew Thomas won it the year before. Uh, all right, that's the award show, Justin. You got we anything? It. No, we'll uh, we may we'll have an award uh, winner on the show Friday. Yeah, I was about to say we'll see you Friday, and what we may have an award winner. We may have an award winner. So you're like, you guys are gonna have Evan Neal on? No, no. No, we're not. Although I want to do some film sessions with O-line guys that talk about Neil at some point in this offseason. Um, looking at the history of the voting, who's the most random player to win an award, do you think? Aaron Robinson's pretty random. Um, I voted most improved in 2020. Do you remember who? Most improved in 2020? No. Isaac Yadam. Wow. Yeah. Is is uh, that the most random? Uh, does he win it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. You're, so, listeners' offensive MVPs have been Thomas, Thomas, Gallman. The Gallman one pissed me off. Gallman. Mine were Gates. Uh, mine were Thomas, Thomas, Gates. Yours is Thomas, Thomas, Shepard. Defensive player of the year has been different every year. Let's see. This year, Dex. Last year, the listeners went McKinney. And then the year before, they went Bradbury. Who did I go with in 2020? For defensive player of the year? Yeah. Blake. I did that over Leo? Yeah, that is surprising that you did what that. What the hell is wrong with me? 
You didn't give Leo any awards in 2020. What? You gave Dex most underrated, Logan Ryan most improved, most underwhelming Ingram, and then you gave Rookie of the Year to Darnay Holmes. I can't believe myself. Rookie of the Year was fun in 2020. Like it was a it was a pretty tight race between Andrew Thomas, uh, Darnay, and Tay Crowder. <laughs> yeah, it remember Tay Crowder? Um, so I'm, trying I'm to really mad at myself. I didn't give anything. I didn't give any any Leo love in 2020. Really deserved it. Listeners gave Nick Gates most underrated. It's funny that the listeners gave Nick Gates most underrated for 2020 when they underrated him and should have voted him most outstanding offensive player. Wow. And people are like, Nick Gates, most outstanding offensive player? Tell me who else should have won in 2020. Wayne Gallman. Yeah, no. No, definitely <laughs> not Wayne Gallman. Our, our backup running Alfred Morris, who was 95 years old, averaged more yards a, t- a touch than, than Wayne Gallman that year. Mm. Don't forget that, Gallmanites. Do not revise history. Not going to lie, you reading off some of those awards that we gave out, especially like in 2020. Pretty depressing. It's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're in a better spot now. The defensive weren't bad. Like the 2020 defense was fun. Uh, offensively, absolutely not. No. Yeah. Offensive league. All right. We appreciate you guys. We'll be back on Friday uh, with an award winner, most likely. Don't like to say things until they're official, but we should have an award winner on Friday. It's going to be a fun off season. It's going to be a fun off season. We've turned the page. We're getting ready for the Senior Bowl. We'll see you then. Until then, let's go big blue.